Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Jack Joseph and Morton Mandel Center for Studies in Jewish Education at Brandeis University. I'm John Levison. I'm director of the center. I'm delighted to welcome you to this ongoing series of conversations with scholars of Jewish education. Today's session and our other events help us to serve the mission of the Mandel Center by supporting scholarship and getting important ideas out into the world. And we encourage you to take a look at the Mandel Center events page to learn about our other upcoming events. We're delighted to have many of you joining us live, and we hope to take some of your questions as we go. So feel free to post those questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. I'll be keeping an eye on those. And we're also recording today's session, and we'll make the recording available afterwards, as we always do on our website and via our podcast. Our guest today is uh, my colleague, Talia Hurwitz. Talia did her doctorate at NYU. She was also a, she was also a fellow in the inaugural cohort of our doctoral fellows program here at the Mandel Center for Studies in Jewish Education a couple of years back. She completed a postdoc, uh, postdoctoral fellowship at Drexel University, and she's now a research fellow at KASG, the Collaboratory for Applied Studies in Jewish Education. I invited Talia to participate in the series so that we could talk about uh, an article that she published recently in the journal called English Teaching. Um, and it's, a, it's an article that is about um, graphic novels or rather graphic novel adaptations of uh, Jewish texts. Uh, the full title is Reconsidering Religious Gender Normativity in graphic novel adaptations. Talia, welcome. It's good to see you. It's wonderful seeing you as well. Thank you for inviting me to this. My pleasure. My pleasure. Okay, so let's start with, as I always like to do, let's start with the backstory for this project. Um, how did you decide that you wanted to study graphic novels and why graphic novel adaptations of classical Jewish texts? And then why focus on the modern Orthodox community in particular? You're the, the students that you studied, the young people that you studied were modern Orthodox young women. Why focus on them in, in particular? And if that's not enough, I even have one more question, which is I always want to understand how my guests do their scholarly work. So tell us a little bit about your actual methodology as a scholar. What is the research project process for an article like this? What does that look like? So, okay, um, for questions like these, there's always the autobiographical answer where you talk about your life and blah, 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 um, as well as then the scholarly answer. Um, there's something always in the middle there. Um, so autobiographically, just outside of my academic life, um, I had previously taught writing using uh, graphic novels. I was traveling to conferences. I was noticing there were a lot of assertions being made about these texts without much evidence to support it. Um, and because, because this was having a moment of intense reflection, a lot of focus on it, um, I kind of so had a sense that there was a place that we needed to actually look at this. Um, academically, a lot of my interests live in these thoughts and distinctions between highbrow and lowbrow media. Hmm. Um, you know, for example, when I taught with graphic novels, I did it because I found that students were very nervous about writing nonfiction. And so if you kind of clump it with graphic novels, it opens things up a little bit. Um, but basically what happened was I was reading, it was one of the graphic novels I used in my study, J.T. Waldman's adaptation of Megillat Esther. Um, I was blown away by that work. And it was really interesting to me that there's this confluence of a lowbrow comic book um, and a text that's not e even just highbrow, but it's holy. You know, you 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 don't add or remove a word from it. We, we take this very, very seriously. Um, and it made me wonder what, you know, people who hold a holy text in such high esteem would make of this weird confluence of different media. Um, that's what got me to modern orthodoxy. 
um, beyond, uh, in addition to uh, um, just the fact that, again, autobiographically, that is by and large the community that I exist in. And one of the things that researchers are told is start with the stuff that you know. Um, and that was something that I knew. Uh-huh. And so then what did the, how did the, how did the research pro- process actually play out? Yeah. So I then went from there. Um, really, I, um, I had that adaptation of Miguelat Astaire and then I started thinking about, okay, what are the other books out there? Um, these adaptations have existed since 1943. Um, you just kind of have to know about them. Um, so what were the others that I'd be interested in? I wanted, um, adaptations that actually maintained the biblical text. So I got onto two others. I then decided, let's look at these through having, having my participants, um, read them in front of me and react to them. It's a method called a think aloud. Um, so the way that I said it is regularly pause and tell me what you're thinking. It could be something you liked, something you didn't like, something that confused you, something it reminded you of. There is no right, wrong, or even smart thing to say. Just tell me what's on your mind. Um, we, I, we then talked about the experience. I found out some information about um, what they did in general through a survey. And I ended up getting a lot of really great transcripts of readings, musings, finding out all of these different ways that they're making meaning. And um, I found that I wanted something that would allow me to have both that big bird's eye view, as well as the ability to kind of pick very closely at things that were interesting um, Mm -hmm. to me that I found. Um, And so I ended up doing this mixed methods analysis um with a Tell us method- what that means mixed methods basically it means that you do a lot of different things to analyze um so for example what i did was i started uh, um kind of looking at the statistics of what i was reading okay so in all of these lines of reading when did they um react to an image when did they use hebrew in their analysis when were these comments things that could have theoretically happened had they just opened a Bible and right. read it straight from there, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, then looked at also the topics that they were talking about. Were they talking about women? Were they bringing in, like, were they talking about Midrash? Um, and were they talking about com- rabbinic commentary? Were they talking about um, their American lived lives? Um, and from there, because you have all of these quantities now, um, you can say, what was the thing that was used the most? How are these different ways of knowing and topics of consideration connected right. um, through these networks? And then through that, you start to identify the things that you can start piecing apart and saying, okay, right. what's really happening when they're talking about, oh, I don't like how the artist drew this, you know, drew the beauty of right. um, Queen Esther, so to say. So Talia, one of the things that uh, um, is interesting to me as you describe your interests in the topic and your process, there's a continuity, as you said, often, which is which is familiar from a lot of educational research, continuity to your own teaching practice Right. You had some experience using these kinds of materials that was intriguing to you. It generated some questions. You had some sense of how students, some students do respond. But of course, then you're going into a research process and you're saying, I don't want to just trust my kind of impressionistic sense of what happened in the classroom. I want to be more systematic about it, more rigorous about it. I want to be really clear about what I'm asking about how the students react. And then you're gathering data in a much more systematic way, analyzing the data in a much more systematic way to understand the moves that they make, right? Where where their thinking goes, how they how they respond. So so now let's get to the argument at the at the 30,000 foot level. What did you learn? What do you want us to know about what happens when these young women 
uh, encounter graphic novels or specifically graphic adaptations of classical texts? Yeah, um, it, it was great. Um, these are all texts and stories that these young women, they're high schoolers. They've studied these texts mm -hmm. for a decade. Plus, they're familiar with this material quite closely. Um, and specifically, these adaptations, they don't abridge or change the text. Um, you know, they may only exclusively use translations instead of the Hebrew. Um, but, you know, the text itself is familiar. It's just being repurposed into this new format. Um, and yet I saw readers having these emotional reactions when they were reading stories that mm -hmm. they've tread upon again and again and again. They could sometimes felt happy, enthusiastic. They sometimes felt sad. They sometimes were confused, sometimes angry. And sometimes these reactions were quite strong. I, one of my participants um, at a certain point when she was um, reading the story about Vashti, um, and it's Vashti, she's modern Orthodox. She's heard this story every single year in, you know, on, on Purim. Um, and she pauses and goes, wow, this is really hard. Um, and, you know, those reactions were kind of surprising in, a, in their own way. Um, and as I continued looking at it, I noticed that these reactions were happening when they were talking about the images or right immediately after reflecting on the images. Um, so these images create moments of dissonance at times. Mm -hmm. Um, and because this dissonance is happening con in connection to images um, that, you know, so they're not as directly connected to the Bible, to rabbinics. Um, they're not straight from the word, you know, they're not straight from the mouth of God, so to say. Uh -huh. um, it created a space to allow them to navigate from that point of dissonance in a way that was personally meaningful for them. So can um, you just can you explain a little bit more when 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 she says this is hard that the story of Vashti is hard, it, she's reacting to the misogyny of the, what is she reacting to? So, in that particular case, she was reacting to the misogyny. There was she knew what was about to happen. Um, this was happening. This particular moment happened. Um, yeah, right when Mumu Khan stepped up, he was one of, for those not familiar with the story, he's one of the advisors to the king. The king says, you know, Queen Vashti has refused my um, my command of her. What should we do? And he's about, and Mumu Khan then says, um, this is a big deal. It's not, you know, this isn't just something that Vashti did, but this risks all women disobeying their husbands. Right, it threatens the patriarchy. Yes, it threatens the patriarchy, and ultimately um, Vashti disappears from the scene. Um, and so this is right after Mumu Khan says this is a big problem. It They haven't yet gotten to Mumu Khan telling the king to get rid of her. Um, she knows what's about to happen, and the image is one, it's this big single illustration on a single page and these women are drawn almost in a surrealist kind of style that makes them look monstrous mm -hmm. um you know one has like this tongue that's going out with thorns attached to them um there's a lot of swirling and in the center is mamukhan with his hands like this um and so you're really what you're doing is you're jumping into his head hmm as he's talking to the king and you're seeing something grotesque mm -hmm. and you're seeing it, you know, and for those who know the story, know that something that has troubled, that has troubled many people um, is about to happen. And it just kind of, she knows what's going to happen. And this image just turns up or dials up that intensity mm -hmm. Um to a story that, you know, ultimately, I think there's a very interesting question to ask um, of why the story exists in the book in the first place. Why don't you just start with, and now we have here Queen Esther. Right, um, this right. is a character that disappears very quickly. Um, and, so, yeah. um, 
it, it's, a, it's a fascinating anecdote it really brings us into, and you've, you've talked about dissonance. You made, you made it clear that one of the dynamics with these particular texts and these particular young women is that um, the texts themselves are not new, right? So there's a, there's um, an interplay between the familiarity of the text on the one hand and the newness of the graphic of, of the graphic image. Um, so, um, and now you 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 just use that really evocative phrase that dials up the intensity. So I want to understand more. What's what to the extent that you could tell from from the research? Why? Do graphic images work in this way, as opposed to I don't know? You could have given them a commentary and write another commentary, or a contemporary feminist, or, or you know, it could have been anything. Um, but the graphic image, your your hypothesis is you haven't done comparative study, but your hypothesis is that something special happens with this graphic image, and so why? So I think there are a few things. Um, it's almost. It's almost like the phenomenon of having a laugh track on a sitcom <laughs> um, in a very different way. But, you know, when there's a laugh track on a sitcom, it invites the um, viewer to laugh. And people have found that if a sitcom has a laugh track, people are more likely to laugh at jokes when they maybe shouldn't have gotten the laugh. Um, what you have in these graphic novels uh, with most image-based adaptations is there are certain things that don't that just don't happen in written prose. Every medium has its affordances and its challenges. Um, and with a visual medium, you need to you need to illustrate the background. You need to illustrate the secondary characters. You need to illustrate silence. Um, so what happens is you start to also see people or characters who are secondary or who aren't necessarily speaking, who may not, whose reactions may not have been included in um, text, especially when you think about how, you know, refrains the Bible can be in sharing details at times. Um, and the adapter has to draw an emotional reaction. Mm -hmm. um, it's just non-negotiable. They get to then decide what they think that reaction is going to be. Um, and so, you know, one of the stories that I had was with um, Abram and Sarai, who then become Abraham and Sarah. If you see Sarah crying, um, your heart goes out to her. You you kind of be, get drawn into that emotional space that she's in, um, even though she doesn't say a word. Yeah. Um, let me so let me build build on that for a, a sec. Um, uh, a long time ago, I don't know. It's probably probably twenty years ago now. Um, the, a terrific uh, scholar of the Bible named Barry Levy um, shared with me his observation that if you show children or any students a picture of a biblical scene and of course there's a long there's a long history of of especially in bible biblical scenes being illustrated right having having occasional illustrations uh, integrated into um into a bible um if you show people a, a biblical scene an illustrated biblical scene they think they know what happened but if you show them two pictures he was thinking pedagogically you show them two pictures then they're in the space of interpretation. Then they're realizing that the artist is making choices about what to portray and how to portray and you know the faces or whatever it happens to be, the elements of the text that are that they're going to emerge. But what I hear you saying about these graphic novels is, um, and maybe it's something about the genre of graphic novels, which are different than just occasional illustrations, that actually even one image, right, of the story of Esther or whatever, even even one um, kind of accelerates that process, moves moves the students. You saw that you saw the images move the students into that space of interpretation, and and I'm curious if that's a if that's a correct interpretation, and if so, what do you think it is about the genre of graphic novels in particular, graphic novel adaptations in particular, that kind of accelerates that move into 
kind of self-aware, not self-awareness, but awareness of the interpretive process? So I, I think that like the, it's actually correct that I would say that there are certain images that stick with them um, that they then kind of start to interpret, react to. Um, but the thing that's interesting about graphic novels, comics as a medium is that they aren't single they aren't single pictures. Um, they are deliberately sequenced pictures that are separated. Um, the technical term for that separation between pictures is gutters. Um, and there is a whole theory that the gutters might actually be more important to interpretation than the pictures themselves. Um, because what happens, you have one picture followed by another picture. Um, now, these pictures could be very similar. It could just be one action followed by another similar action, but it might not be. You might change perspective. You might go from focusing one character to another character to maybe an omniscient um, narrator. You might be changing from one scene to the next. You might zoom in on a detail. There are all these different ways that you can change you, you then change the picture. And it requires the reader's interpretive power to look at these two images and say, okay, how are they connected? And in finding out that connection, that's actually how much of the story gets composed um, in, in filling those blanks. And it has to happen with the reader. If not, they're going to see a lot of dissociated images, say, what on earth am I looking at? Close it, walk away. Um, so it already creates that interpretive space. Um, and uh, That's really interesting. Um, I want to remind um, uh, our listeners that they should feel free to use the Q&A function um, at the bottom if they want to if they want to post questions as part of the conversation. Um, so it's really interesting to think about the sequencing of images in a graphic novel, which is different than, let's say, the episodic illustrations, right? When we have an illustrated Bible, we tend we we have no expectation that it's telling the whole story. Um, we just think, oh, well, you know, they decided to throw in this picture of whatever of of Abraham and Abraham and Sarai and. And then we'll get another picture, you know, next chapter or two chapters later. But here, the sequencing actually drives part of the interpretive process. Um, that's that's really interesting. Um, you you wrote near the end of the article. Um, I found this, this fascinating sentence. I want to quote it back to you. You wrote that participants do not simply relate to graphic novel adaptations of Jewish texts as strictly Jewish artifacts but as American ones as well. They don't only relate to the adaptations as Jewish texts or as strictly Jewish artifacts, but as American ones as well. So tell us what you meant in that um, in that sentence and why it's important. Basically comic books, comic books specifically, graphic novels as well exist within um, American popular culture. Um, they're very deeply in there. It was created in America. Many of them were Jewish, but it's very much an American, in many ways, type of text. Um, and there were, at times, moments when these participants very much were relating to it in that way. Um, one example is there are a lot of women in, in Jewish texts who are described as beautiful. Um, and the question is, what does that mean? You have to draw this now. Um, you have to draw this woman's beauty. Um, you have to draw their clothes. You have to draw their demeanor, everything about them. And there were several people when they were looking at the way that Sar Sarai was being drawn. They effectively said, you know, this is supposed to be a, she's supposed to be a beautiful woman, but I don't see her being drawn modestly as well. Um, which in that single sentence is creating this connection of what is beauty? Beauty is modesty. That's a very Jewish idea um, that is completely different from the Greco-Roman idea of beauty is youth. Hmm. 
Um, or then you have this other, um, you know, and, and then there's a third person who then starts talking about this drawing and saying, oh, this is her term, her, her words, this is complete fan service. What is fan service? Fan service is something that exists in the comic book world. Um, it is, it reflects the way that women in comic books have been drawn in the past where, you know, they're certain, you know, <laughs> they're curvy, they're drawn scantily clad. And the idea is it is in service of the predominantly male fan base. Um, and so in that sense, her understanding of why this this is being drawn, she's being drawn this way, has nothing to do with Judaism. Yeah. It has everything to do with the fact that this is part, this book is an artifact of American culture that has a lot of boys reading it and they want to see a little, you know, they, they want to see the women look a little bit more risque. Mm -hmm. um, so, so you, what you saw among these readers, um, their encounter with the text is that um, as opposed to, let's say, I don't know, if you had offered them a medieval commentary, they might not have been attuned to how medieval it was, right? Like yeah. where exactly from, you know, 12th century Spain it, it, it emerged. But there were elements of American culture that really popped for them. They recognized these graphic novel adaptations as um, as commentaries emerging from a particular cultural American cultural context. Yeah. And in that, there's also that element of, you know, you can pick that apart and start talking about. So what do you think Judaism's role in American life writ large or their specific American lives should be? Should beauty be about modesty or not? Mm -hmm. um, what, what do you think should be? Should, should qualify as beautiful. Right, uh, right. And uh, I love that you just said that, Talia. It actually begins to answer one of the questions um, from the audience, which has to do with um, so what guidance would you give to um, to instructors, teachers who use graphic novels? And I'm already hearing, think about all the conversations that are opened up by um, by the use of uh, of graphic novels. Any anything else that you would say that comes to mind as sort of emerging from the scholarship about guidance for for using these materials? One of the things that you know I really think is wonderful about using with graphic novels and a challenge is I mean, these are these are me this is a medium that you don't really get trained in to read. Um, at the same time, we live in a world that is increasingly multimodal. Um, it's not only just there are visuals and images out there and there is prose and text out there, but you're also, you're getting these layered together a lot. Um, it could be ads, it could be memes. You see, look at a social feed and you see a lot of that. Um, and, you know, whereas, Whereas I am still in the generation of which Facebook was only for college kids. <laughs> um, that's not the case for any of the, our students anymore. <laughs> um, they have grown up putting words and images together their entire lives. Um, and so in certain ways, there's a part of me that tends to trust their interpretive turns. <laughs> um because this is their world. This is their world. They mm -hmm. they are native to this kind of um, communication, whereas we had to learn it as we went along. <laughs> um, and in certain ways, it requires a lot of um, it requires a lot of experience and a lot of courage to let students kind of take a lead in certain ways. Mm. Um, but you know the the richness of graphic novels is really trying to find the spaces of inter for interpretation that you wouldn't use in in the Bible and use it so, to the worlds. 
So you, maybe you already start to answer this, but I want to I want to give you the opportunity to formulate your answer to the last question that I always ask, which is, why does this research matter for Jewish educators, Jewish leaders? Why should we care? What's your answer? I, I mean, my answer is effectively, you know, I, Jewish educators, Jewish leaders, most Jews out there have very strong feelings about teaching Jewish texts. Um, and not only that, we have a very strong desire to allow for every individual to directly engage with said Jewish text. Um, you know, it's one of the staying powers of Hebrew. It's, you know, the, the Bible is taught so much. And we really want everyone to have all the tools they need to have a personal engagement with it. Um, one of the things that I think we're a little less good at at times is giving students the tools they need to dive within. Hmm. Um, you know, they, how to kind of unlock how they would personally engage with the text, not just simply engage with the text. Um, so, you know, the big takeaway for me is, you know, whether you want to take or leave graphic novels, I, I I can respect the decision either way. I think every educator should use what works for them. Um, but I think the big takeaway is to think about creating space and bringing in the tools that invite for personal reflection and exploration when engaging with a book. Um, and graphic novels can be great if you so choose to use them. Yeah, yeah, great, great. Thank you, Talia. Um, it's great to talk with you about your work. Um, I wanna thank all of you for joining us. I encourage you to check out the Mendel Center events page to learn about our other upcoming events. You can also subscribe to our YouTube page and our podcast. Our next event will be a webinar um, titled Race, Ethnicity, and Immigration in Jewish Education. This is co-sponsored with the Journal of Jewish Education and the Grant Center at Tulane, um, and that's coming up on May 2nd. Thank you again, Talia. Thank you all for joining us. Take care.